Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today will be another unusual program. My old friend John Alexander is in the studio with me. He is the author of Reality Denied, First-Hand Experience with Things That Can't Happen But Did, as well as UFOs, Myths, Conspiracies, and Realities, and also Future War. John has had a uh, many decades career in the military. He has his doctoral uh, degree from Walden University. He's the past president of the International Association for Near-Death Studies. Welcome, John. Thank you, Jeff. Glad to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. Uh, you know, what's been in the news most recently, I think, regarding UFOs ha has been the revelation of uh, the case that goes back to 2007 to the aircraft carrier Nimitz. In fact, sure. an entire group of uh, sure. aircraft carrier group with many ships and airplanes. And I understand they observed uh, tic-tac-shaped UFOs, lozenge-shaped UFOs for about a week. Many, many sightings. Well, it was. And this was quite a uh, consternation for them because what they saw were things that were you know, at altitude, 80,000 feet, more than one or two, uh, coming down at times, literally on the deck on the ocean, it seemed to be interacting with something that was subsurface, uh, and then would zip off. Now, the, the Tic Tac sighting that you're talking about is where the pilots went out and intercepted it, and so you had both radar sightings from the ships, radar on board the aircraft, and visual sightings from the pilot. So you have multi you know, disciplinary things corroborating that a real event was taking place. And importantly, as you said, is this went on for quite a period of time. Mm -hmm. And I uh, have seen the video. It was formally released. Mm -hmm. uh, Lou Alessandro, who was the uh, for DIA, who was the one running the study on it, and eventually retired to try and get the information out. Mm -hmm. But they did uh, formally get it released by the Navy a bit reluctantly, but uh, nonetheless in the same. And what we're led to believe is there are many other such tapes, uh, and we may have seen within the past couple of weeks of the time that we're filming this, uh, the Navy has put out a new policy mm -hmm. on reporting UFOs uh, openly, and quite different from decades past. And, and what's the difference? The difference is they're going to make, supposedly, they are, pilots are told to report seeing UFOs, where this applies to only the Navy so far. Uh -huh. But in the, in the past, pilots were sort of discouraged from reporting? Oh, this is not career enhancing. Yeah. Uh, and it was kind of interesting that these files were, you know, radar sightings were, you know, stored in, in files, uh, but there was great reluctance to come forth and so on, for several reasons. Uh, embarrassment is one. Uh, the other from a pilot perspective, and we've seen this in many, many other cases where, you know, the, you have or get called in for psychological evaluation if you're seeing things that can't possibly be there. So the easiest uh, approach is just don't report. Yeah. So um, this particular case involves uh, very good observations going on over an extended period of time of, of multiple vehicles and the vehicles were able to uh, engage in maneuvers that are uh, well beyond the capability of our jet planes. Oh, far beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, they were at high altitude, low altitude, hovering near the ocean, uh, high G, you know, right angle right turns. Right angle turns at high speed. Uh, at uh, things that humans would not survive mm -hmm. under our current understanding of uh, you know the engineering that would be necessary to do that mm -hmm. so yeah it was amazing and it went 
for a long time was just basically in the file. Uh, quite frankly, the Navy, well, the government per se, does not like to engage in things that they can't explain. Yeah. Uh, and we are tied off. We should point out that, you know, at this juncture, we've technically been at war since 2001. And so for the last 18 years, been involved in conflict. Most of the resources and things that uh, uh, would go into that uh, certainly do not, they do not want a distraction mm -hmm. uh, to go off into these other areas. Despite but, a lot of the people, probably the people watching this mm -hmm. would say, oh, that's very, very interesting. Yeah. Huh? Well, I presume that the government has made an evaluation and determined that whatever these things are, they don't pose a, a military threat. Well, this goes back to the Condon Report. Mm -hmm. Remember that Project Blue Book that went back through yeah. the 50s and 60s, it was grudge and sign before that, and then Blue Book, in which the Air Force was tasked to look at this, and they had officers who would report it, and they finally brought in what's known as the Colorado Report. And most people misunderstand. They think the question to Condon was, are UFOs real? It was not. It was, are UFOs a threat? The Department of Defense does just that. They do defense kinds of things. Yeah. And dealing with other abnormalities is not necessarily within their bailiwick. And it's a lot of it's resource constrained. You know, where are you going to put your resources? So mm -hmm. when you do research in these areas, it takes money and it means that you're not doing something else. But it would seem to me that periodically when new sightings keep occurring over and over again, which they do, yeah. uh, the government needs to reevaluate. Is, is it still not a threat? Well, and, and that's exactly what they did with this. And, <clears throat> but the other aspect is that you know, what you were saying was so far beyond our capabilities. Yeah. Now, the big concern initially, of course, is, is this Soviet using the bad old days, now Russia, is it Chinese, is there some potential near-peer adversary who's made a big leap in technology? Mm -hmm. That would be a major concern. Mm -hmm. But when you can eliminate that, then the other goes into, well, this is interesting and we'll watch it uh, periodically. And, and that's really the state of things right now with regard to the government. Right. Uh, one of the things I point out, um, and I haven't lectured. There are 962 authorized flag slots in the Army, Navy, and Air Force, okay? Those are generals and admirals. Um, I estimated that since Blue Book, that there's probably been about 6,000 people who have held that position. Mm -hmm. And if we guess that 10% of them have seen UFOs. And that's just based on, yeah, the government people see UFOs just like the general public. Mm -hmm. My question is, why haven't there been a hell of a lot more studies? And I do give uh, an example. Uh, when I was doing a, a study, as you know, that I ran in the uh, 80s, mm -hmm. and I talked to a uh, now retired three star who was the head of one of those three letter agencies. And what he said was, a, we don't do that because yeah. there's no institutional requirement to collect data, but I'll tell you about the ones I saw. So here he had personal experience, but that did not translate into him saying, you know, somebody figure out what this is. Mm -hmm. Now, let me jump a, a bit because uh, recently I was at a UFO conference as a speaker and I, there were other speakers at the conference. Some of them were the uh, airmen and, and sailors, uh, a part of the Nimitz uh, yeah. attack group, reporting on what they had seen. Uh, they, many of them were still, after more than a decade, very, very profoundly moved by having had these sightings. Right. Uh, but there were also people talking about a wide range of things that would have to fall into the realm of conspiracy theory, including crashed UFOs and cover-ups of crashed UFOs, and but even more striking, 
uh, many, many people believe, and, and the uh, Gaia Network has been promoting, I think, on over a hundred episodes, although I think it's now discontinued, a fellow named Corey Good who talks about uh, he's traveled many times to Mars, where the U.S. government has secret bases, and uh, <laughs> Stephen Greer, a medical doctor, claims that the U.S. government has possessed UFO technology since since the 1940s. Yeah. Well, at least, at least the 50s on his website where yeah. he said we've had this technology. Uh, if so, treason has occurred. Mm -hmm. Because in my view, the issue of understanding UFOs being able to do these kinds of distances and time travel, etc., yeah. the fundamental issue here is energy. And, you know, global climate change is one of the key issues at the moment, and we're wedded to carbon industries. Yeah. Uh, if we had this sort of technology, the issue would not be can little widgets fly around, be kind of neat, but not nearly essential, as opposed to we'll change our energy system and all of the problems with coal burning and even nuclear would go away. Mm -hmm. So I think the evidence is strongly against. I might mention the Mars base and something we had talked about privately before. Um, when you start thinking about that, and there was a researcher who we both know who had written and said, you know, um, flights slip out of Canaveral all of the time. Yes. And the answer is no, when we launch from Cape Canaveral, uh, in half of Florida is aware, because you see these things going up. And you start thinking about the logistical requirements that it would take to maintain a base on Mars. Mm -hmm. And it just belies all kind of logic. Yeah. Well, I have heard, to push the conspiracy argument further, those who point to a news story that shows that I think the Pentagon ha has been unable to account for about a trillion dollars over the years, and that's funding the secret space program. Yeah, well, the people who say that don't understand the funding process at mm -hmm. all. Now, in fairness, and one of the things that does bring that up is literally the day before 9-11, uh, Rumsfeld, who was then Secretary of Defense, came forward and said, you know, a trillion dollars is missing and all that. Now, to say it's missing, missing is very different from saying our accounting system is not nearly as good as it should be. Mm. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I point out is very few people, even in the military, or other parts of the government understand how the government is funded and how the system works. And what you have is a one to end priority list of things that you must do, and then you get down to things you want to do and then things that would be nice to do. Well, you might run out of money probably long before the things you must do. And there's tremendous competition uh, for the dollars in both the white and what you colloquially call a black world. Mm -hmm. in, in other words, even in the so-called deep state black world, there are people competing for the available dollars. Yeah. And, well, first of all, just so we know, I come down against the deep state, if you yeah. will. These are basically career employees who have been there for decades, mm -hmm. and we used to call it the B team. You know, when they would take over and have people they didn't like, they say, I'd be here when you come, I'd be here when you leave. <laughs> and their job was to maintain uh, stability, yeah. uh, if you will, and what they thought it was done. Mm -hmm. Um, that's far different than the attempted coups that we're mm -hmm. uh, now hearing about. But the competition, I'll give you an example, the study that you mentioned that followed the Nimitz sighting, and you hear about the $22 million that was uh, allocated, um, and that was over a period of years. Mm -hmm. Not in our bank account, but you know, by DOD standards, we're not talking lunch money, okay? Mm -hmm. And I do know that one of the things that happened is they put out a, a, a requirements that said, you know, we do advanced threats. Mm -hmm. And other people came along and said, wait a minute, we do advanced aerial threats and went in and snatched the money. So that's not something that the outside public would see, but the, the competition internally is absolutely fierce. Mm -hmm. but one of the things that used to get me, I worked, as you mentioned, uh, I was in the actually in the Pentagon uh, for a while. Yeah. 
And one of the favorite things is people say, I'm going to go find the money. Mm. Well, there are no pots of money. When you say, I'm going to find the money, it means you're going to raid somebody else's program or try to find something where the funds have not been there. No, we have a terrible system on allocation of funds and how they must be committed by a certain time or you, 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 what they call use or lose, mm -hmm. which does lead to a fair amount of uh, probably... Uh, not, not the best use of resources. Mm -hmm. We also are on a fun, five year funding cycle. And so you have to uh, program out. A lot of that is run by uh, the comptrollers. Mm -hmm. And they know back about you know the projects. All they're saying, do the curves look right? You know, when the funding level, it doesn't take into account, oh, at a certain time, you may need to be a, have a big jump in funding or you may mm -hmm. need to buy something that's really expensive, which will change the, the project, uh, mm -hmm. projection. Mm -hmm. So the trillion dollars that Rumsfeld spoke of, uh, it's really not a question of the money's just missing. It's no. more a question of it may not have been uh, accounted for properly. Yeah. Remember, the, again, literally the day before 9-11. So he was yeah. really getting ready from a political standpoint to take on the military industrial complex and try to make big changes, uh, and some of which were needed, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, in the accounting systems and all that. And when 9-11 hit, I mean, everything went out the window. And we did start sending, they complained about pallets of money. Yeah, they were literally, if they went into Iraq, sending pallets of money to you know, reconstitute the system in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, just bringing up the phrase 9-11 evokes all kinds of conspiracy theories. And it, it dawned on me, thinking about, the, the notion of conspiracy theories in general. Some people think it's a, a legitimate academic field of study, conspiracy theory. And uh, it dawned on me that two things. First of all, many viewers of this program, because I talk about parapsychology, which is considered by many uh, pseudoscience or yes. non-science. Oh, there, uh, so the, there are people who think there's a conspiracy to suppress data of parapsychology. Uh, but it dawned on me that the old, oldest conspiracy theory that I can think of would be Gnosticism as a whole. The idea that our entire planet has been taken over by a, a counterfeit god who's pretending to be the real god and is, <laughs> is running things, you know, uh, the archons, uh, that there are, uh, in, in effect, spiritual entities who, who shouldn't be running this planet but are. That, that's sort of the basis of many conspiracy theories. We do. You, you have these uh, celestial fights that are going on between yeah. demons and archdemons and, you know, archangels and, you know, your, your name of... Uh, yeah. Uh, the war the in heaven. heaven. It, it, yes. it, it's an old idea. And that, that that we're just the battleground. Yeah. Uh, we, our minds, our very yeah. brains, our consciousness is the battleground yeah. for spiritual entities. But one of the things, remember, very early in my presentations, I say, if you're going to study any of these areas, mm -hmm. UFOs, one, there's three things that you need. One is you better have thick skin because you're going to be attacked. Yeah. I don't care what your position is, somebody is going to attack you. Um, one is you better have a day job because very few people are making any substantial amount of money in this. And the third is you must understand conspiracy theory because either you believe that there's a conspiracy in that or if you don't, you're part of the cover-up. Mm -hmm. And many people have accused you of exactly that. Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It happen, happens all the time, and you, uh, how do you deal with that? Like I said, rule one, you better have thick skin. Yeah. <laughs> and you try to ignore it. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of it, I mean, the noise level gets up every once in a while. And uh, yeah. unfortunately, as we're seeing, and we have discussed in other areas related to what's going on now, but, you know, rationalism is kind of tough to come by on understanding why people believe some of the things they do and the implications of it once they have accepted a belief system mm -hmm. and are trying to change that. It's to be very, very difficult. Yeah, I, I understand that. I Certainly, uh, after many of my 
videos, people will post comments from the perspective of one or another conspiracy theory. Uh, I've heard that uh, you know all the problems in the world are due to the Freemasons, or they're due to the Jews, or they're due to the Catholics, or they're, it's usually the Nazis, or the, the anti-fascists. The trilateralists, and yeah. the Bundesburgers, and the, the Illuminati. And people seem to be wanting to find somebody to blame. One of the issues that might surprise folks is they generally come down against secrecy. And I've been talking recently about in the UFO community, do you even want the government involved? Mm -hmm. Because they bring a number of things. They have some excellent sensor systems that are not available in the public world. Yeah. Got some brain power, particularly mm -hmm. if you look at national laboratories yeah. uh, and some other things. But you bring the propensity to classify. And the problem with classification is it leads to exactly what you're discussing here. If we don't understand it, there must be some controlling mechanism behind it, some nefarious purpose, some of the great they, and we've never understood who they are. I mean, there's a host of they's out there. Um, I'll give a specific example. You know, I've worked with the Council on Foreign Relations. This is in weapons research. And there's a general popular, or popular belief that this is a you know, megalithic uh, entity that thinks all in one. And I can tell you in there, uh, you, they come from a wide variety of belief systems and have their own agendas and whatnot. And they fight fiercely. It is not a concerted effort of how do we control the world. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm inclined <laughs> to think that the world is very pluralistic, and to the extent that conspiracies do exist there, it's not like a, a, a mastermind control over the whole world. Oh, absolutely. But again, I think the whole issue of secrecy mm -hmm. kind of generates and fosters these conspiracy theories. And that's why real transparency is probably one of the best things we can do in this area. As you know, I've also said, if you're dealing with UFOs in particular, but as you know, my basis is that there are a broad range of phenomena, all of which are related. Yeah. I would also say that uh, my view that uh, this is at least as uh, complex as cancer, if not. And if we're going to approach it, what we need to do is rather than sequestering data and hoarding it, which is a propensity now, is you need to make it as widely available as possible and have integrated studies. I even called for you know, looking at the human genome uh, project and saying what we need is a human genome project-like entity on steroids, probably about two orders of magnitude, should be $300 billion, uh, to tackle the complexity of this issue. Well, um, you know, I just had a, a guest on the program, a mutual friend and colleague, Beverly Rubick. Uh, who argued that we need something equivalent to the Human Genome Project to study energy psychology and, and the, or energy biology, to look at the human being, not just as a mm. collection of molecules, but as a collection mm. of frequencies. But uh, the point, uh, but the Human Genome uh, Project is, is an excellent one. Came yeah. in under budget and in under time in mm -hmm. about nine years. Yeah. And there were about three billion pairs that had to be uh, adjusted, uh, you know. Thirty different universities across well, many different countries. That's the point. Mm -hmm. The multiple universities, multiple countries sharing data. Yeah. Uh, I understand, because I've done some interviews recently about it, that at the end of the day, yes, they decoded the human genome, very important, very important. I don't want to minimize the, right. the, the accomplishment, but what they discovered is that the human genome accounts for a very small portion of human behavior. It doesn't account for all behavior as it was once, once hypothesized. Yeah. Well, behavior and biology are a little bit different, yeah. obviously. Well, what they're, they've discovered, of course, is that in addition to the genes, you have to look at the epigenetic right. factors. So now I understand there is a, a, a consortium to explore epigenetics. Yeah, and, and these will go on. I mean, one of the things I point out when you start getting at any of these studies, wherever you go, about, about the time you think you got it really figured out, 
you also find out there's a whole new order of magnitude of complexity that you yeah. must deal with. Yeah. In fact, I had called as in the past my uh, uh, law of uh, appropriate complexity that people deal with things until they've almost got it figured out and this appears on all level, and then all of a sudden it's wow, look at what else. Is and this is an admonition for people who want to study phenomenology. Mm -hmm. You usually start in with a personal incident or something happened and I want to study this, yeah. and the more you get into it, as you demonstrate by this program and your guests, it gets broader and broader and broader. Yeah, sure. I mean, you suggest, for example, that uh, uh, UFOs are not unrelated to near-death experience. Well, I think in consciousness that, that mm -hmm. is the key factor and it crosses many things from psychokinesis, you know, we've done lots of work with shamans around the world. Yeah. Uh, we've had experiences that, hence the name of the book, things that can't happen but we've seen happen firsthand. Yeah. Um, I point out that if you deal with the spirit world and question in UFOs, are these real, is it ET, I come down against the extraterrestrial hypothesis just because it's too simple, but we have had humans interacting with sentient non-humans throughout the entirety of human history in all cultures, mm -hmm. and that they happen to fly in little metal vessels is relatively new wrinkle to that, even though UFOs have been around for sure. a Sure, I mean, time. they used to call them chariots. Well, I can say this goes on back literally centuries and millennia. Yeah. But you also have, as you know, other kinds of uh, spirits from fairies and elves right. and all the stories, the Menahuni. Uh, again, every culture uh, has them. An but, entire super sensible universe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the question is, these are interrelated, how does that work? Mm -hmm. And as I say, there does appear to be a piece of human consciousness that's uh, sort of the cross-cutting. I point out that, as you know, we've traveled all over the world, as have you, and you start dealing in other cultures, the, the basic assumption in America is, hey, we have some materialistic paradigm uh, that we're in. We also think that everybody thinks like us mm -hmm. and is educated in the same way. Um, what we find, particularly with the spirit world, when you're dealing with you know, developing nations and whatnot, their notion of interaction with the spirit world is very different yeah. from ours. We talk about, in the West, if you believe, I mean, you may not even believe, but if you do, there's a spirit world and the real world, and they're separate and distinct. Mm -hmm. But when I deal with the shamans, you know, they move seamlessly back and forth, and sometimes talking to them is kind of hard to figure out. You know, are we talking about this world where we're sitting and talking now mm -hmm. versus the other? Uh, I'll give an example. We were in West Africa, and you know, shamans there were whose job is to dream and find out what the future is going to be for the community. Yeah. But and this is in Voodoo, which is far more than a religion, mm -hmm. actually a way of life. Mm -hmm. But from a spiritual perspective, if you go out and you're going to pick fruit or pick something, you ask permission, mm -hmm. you know, from the things that for sustenance to come into you. Again, very, very different from you know going to the grocery store and yeah. uh, grabbing an avocado or whatever. It's a completely different mindset. And if we go back historically, even in our culture, two, three hundred years ago, witches were being burned at the stake. <laughs> yeah. Well, and this is where, and even today, mm -hmm. in some cultures, having these extrasensory uh, capabilities uh, can be life threatening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, jumping around some more, our mutual friend and colleague, Jacques Vallée, studied UFOs extensively, and I think he's been the strongest proponent of saying we should try to evaluate UFO phenomena in the context of uh, all of these uh, shamanistic and uh, folklore and mythological traditions that will gain many insights. He has also postulated the idea that UFOs are part of a control system, that uh, mm -hmm. there's an effort by some unknown group uh, to manipulate the evolution of the human species at a subconscious level and that UFOs are part of that. Well, um, one of the hypotheses that's actually gaining more traction is that we are they. 
Mm -hmm. Meaning we're part of a genetic experiment that Earth was seeding with humans and at some point they either created us or at least interacted mm -hmm. and dramatically changed the, the direction that the species were taken. Yeah. Um, and I said, and even in the academic worlds, that's gaining a bit more traction. Well, because we now our, ourselves have the capability of engaging in genetic engineering right. and conducting experiments of a similar nature, and it's not hard to imagine that in another thousand years or so, we, we could apply that technology on other planets. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, um, as you know, I work with Bob Bigelow at the uh, ranch, it was called Skinwalker Ranch. And yes. The whole programs around that. Yes. And I came away with uh, a notion that I call the precognitive sentient phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And that really applies, I think, to the, your suggestion here. And that was that there was a they. Mm -hmm. And it was always one step ahead. And many people who have studied phenomena, uh, I've had several of them where you study it, you're doing instrumentation, and you don't get any results, and then just off camera something happens or something else comes. And the phenomena itself keeps morphing. Mm -hmm. And it's like they, it, whatever it is, it is in control. Mm -hmm. It says, oh, you like that? Try this. <laughs> and you get something totally different. George Hansen, a parapsychologist, has written a book called Parapsychology and the Trickster. And yeah. he, he talks about the trickster archetype, which is very prominent in many shamanistic traditions here in the American yeah. Southwest. Yeah. The, the character Coco Paley you see everywhere is, no. is a trickster. Yeah, well, that's, that's very true. Kripal has done a lot of work. Jeffrey Kripal, well. yeah. yes. Yeah. So there, it, it suggests that, you know, within the human psyche, within what Carl Jung called the collective unconscious, are these archetypal forces. And that, uh, as, as Pogo uh, has once said, we have met the enemy and it is us. Yes. Well, very true. And the trickster has certainly been there. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem, again, gets back to the materialistic belief system that we can cut things into smaller and smaller pieces. Yeah. And, you know, we're looking for the God particle as, as the fundamental building block of reality. Mm -hmm. And again, the, the things that, that I've seen just defy various laws of physics. Yeah. Um, one of my classics in thermodynamics and, and watching in voodoo, with people who you know stand in the fire, sit in the fire, eat the fire, um, the the arcane explanations that the skeptics come up with, like they they have some miracle substance that they put on that protects them and all. It just makes no sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And yet you look at for me, it's the interest is in the outliers. Uh, the laws apply and work very well. When I flip a switch, the light comes on. I understand that. Yeah. The more interesting is when you flip the switch and the light doesn't come on. And this true is true in many, many areas. Mm -hmm. uh, near death, you had asked about that earlier. The example, uh, I like Mary Neal case, for example. She mm -hmm. was kayaking in Chile mm -hmm. and goes over a waterfall and gets wedged underwater probably for 30 minutes. She's a medical doctor. She, she is an MD, a surgeon mm -hmm. in her own right. Yeah. Uh, the complexity of the case just goes on up. But the point is, she's underwater for 30 minutes. What we know, nobody's going to hold their breath that long, particularly when you're having the water beat down uh, on yeah. you. Yeah. And that 99.999% of the people who are underwater that long will die. Mm -hmm. Interesting story about that, but it's really interesting when you find these cases didn't die. Mm -hmm. uh, it just, uh, there was a, a case that just occurred in Norway, I think it was on 60 Minutes, in which somebody fell through the ice and, and was underwater for a similar length of time and they bring them out. Yeah. Again, 99% of the people who had been under the ice for that yeah. long would have died mm -hmm. and yet come out and able to revive them. So it's the outliers to me that are the most interesting and deserve studying. Mm -hmm. Well, and reflecting on that, because I've recently done some 
uh, conversations on epigenetics are some studies in cultures where people do a lot of diving and uh, deep sea divers in, in some of these Polynesian islands are able to stay underwater for about 20 minutes and studies have been done showing that they have modified epigenetically the activation of certain genes that enable them to mm -hmm. um, absorb less, require less oxygen. So but, that they but that's can do the that. case where you have people who are doing this repeatedly yes. and changing. That's the right. ones I'm talking about are accidental. Right. And, and instantaneous. You know that most of them drown. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's, but that's, they don't all. And, right. And, and it strikes me that if, if I had to find one unifying factor that could explain all these diverse phenomena, it, it would be something along the lines that we need a new paradigm completely, that the materialistic paradigm, that the, the bottom line, uh, what, what some philosophers call the primitive, is it's not molecules and quarks and right. subatomic particles. It's consciousness itself. Correct. And we're not alone. Max Planck believed this too. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's not like it's a new thought, but it's one that's sort of been, you know, pushed to the side. In the, and I think part of it has to do, though, with practicality. Mm -hmm. Again, if I go back, you flip the switch, the light comes sure. on. If my objective is to turn on the light, that's really good. The materialistic <laughs> paradigm is incredibly seductive. Correct. Uh, but it may not be accurate. Just because it works most of the time, yeah. it may not be an accurate description of reality. Well, I don't think it is. Yeah. And, you know, we, we talked about uh, research and the funding for research and things that they do. As you know, with the Large Hadron Collider, we have put, I guess, there's about $17 billion into that, looking for the God particle, if you will. If you found that, and people do look at it, it would be of intense interest to a tiny subset of theoretical physicists. Right. Conversely, continuation of consciousness beyond physical death ought to be of interest to 100% of the population. Mm -hmm. And we think that that is where you, uh, we ought to be focusing a lot more research. And again, it's these outliers and from near-death experiences, particularly ones that are instrumented or ones that where the circumstances are such that survival was impossible and yet did happen. And they come back with, oh, let me tell you what happened when it was out there. Mm -hmm. In Mary Neal's case, not only was it current and going out and talking to God and that sort of thing, but being given uh, precognitive information. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, this our last summer, one of the things he said there, there were other things that were, she has not yet revealed that were given to her at, at that time. Well, it's quite interesting how people experiencing out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, also seem to get accurate precognitive information. Uh, Elizabeth Crone, the lady who was the subject of the book Changed in a Flash by Jeffrey Kripal, well, co-authored by Elizabeth and Jeffrey Kripal, was struck by lightning and mm -hmm. uh, had the same well, remember, experience. In Native American, you used to have lightning shamans uh -huh. that, after they were hit by lightning, had these uh, interesting capabilities. I mean, as you know, we were in uh, Mongolia dealing with a reindeer shaman and all that. Everybody's, you know, so now, now we have people who want to be shamans, they get yeah. shaman certified yeah. and all that. These cultures, that's basically not a good thing initially. You go through a tremendous trial period. You're usually an outcast or mm -hmm. deemed as crazy and thrown out of your society uh, before you gain the capabilities to show, hey, there are things we can do like being precognitive mm -hmm. or uh, healing capabilities and those sorts of things and then get reintegrated. But it's usually not a very... Uh, safe and easy process. No, the shamans are traditionally called the wounded healers. They, ha they have to suffer a uh, transformational mm -hmm. illness and heal themselves. Good. No, it, it, it's, it's a process and it's, it's not one where you're going to take a few courses online and get, get a shaman cert certification. But I wonder if our culture as a whole needs to go through a, a process like that, that we become uh, healed because it does seem in, in many, many regards, humanity is sick. Uh, the question is, as you know, like with the shamans, we get outcasts and that, a number of them don't make it. Yeah. You know, 
the, the, the issue with all these phenomena we talk about, we talk to the survivors, right? There are others. Well, it, and it would seem that uh, humanity on this planet has reached a point where our very survival is being threatened, threatened by ourselves. Yes. Well, the whole climate change among things, yeah. uh, our abuse of resources, mm -hmm. uh, like take the U.S., uh, the 4% of the population of the world, it is 25% of, of the resources, mm -hmm. and particularly in energy and things, yeah. uh, unsustainable. Or the fact that half the world is obese and the other half is malnourished. Yes. And, well, I'll give you one, as, as you know, um, the big issue on doing away with malaria, yeah. everybody would say, well, that's a good thing. Yeah. And yeah. we'll agree with that. But if everybody survives and does either doesn't get malaria or survives it, that means that the population growth increases. Yeah. So you have these other unintended consequences that altruistically would be seen as a good thing. But then you have a commitment of resources yeah. and reality on the other side. Are you going to feed them? And because of population growth, for example, in India, I know the water table is being uh, depleted. Well, that's true in many areas. Yeah. You know, I'm from Las Vegas, and <laughs> we are in severe drought, meaning yeah. for a number of years. And uh, you know, Lake Mead itself is going down, and the underground aquifer is being drained. Um, Something that needs serious consideration. Mm -hmm. you know, as we know, the global climate change is real. It is a significant problem. And politically, trying to deny that mm -hmm. is just uh, a potential you know, disaster. And the question you raise, does humanity survive? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're, we're confronting the potential that we might not. After all, many species uh, have uh, come and gone yeah. be before us. Yeah, but, you know, there is, again, you know, the belief system, the thing, well, we're so important that we must survive. And you go, really? With, if you consider the fact that there are billions of uh, potentially habitable planets that might develop intelligent life forms, uh, it's fair to uh, think that, that some of them are going to um, go extinct uh, at their own, yeah. uh, because of their own actions. Well... The, the first question, though, is, is there life elsewhere in the universe? And that mathematically is yes. Uh, and that's just based on pure math. I think we're yeah. up to, what, 200 billion habitable planets someplace, and that number keeps growing. It wasn't but a few years ago we thought of one or two might be out there, and now we know that throughout the universe as many. And so just the probability, even if you're on a pure evolutionary mm -hmm. uh, approach, you know, in the material world sort of thing says, yeah, someplace, something like us evolved someplace else. I think the interesting thing about the existence of uh, UFOs or UAPs, as some people like to call them these days, is it, it does provoke us to think about uh, big picture questions like, you know, the survival of humanity. Well, again, I, I think all of these phenomena that we've talked about here, and there's a host of others, as you know, d derive us in that direction at looking at big picture questions. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the things we haven't discussed is that the, the notion of separateness, mm -hmm. of whether we're separate and independent, of course, we agree that, you know, there's kind of a universal consciousness and that we are part of it. Mm -hmm. And the notion of being separateness is an illusion, albeit a very persistent one. Yeah. And I've been arguing recently, you know, we've been in America first and, and all of that. And what I put out, you know, I said, if you're thinking globally, you're thinking too small. Mm -hmm. That, you know, the interconnection is, is even bigger than that. And that when you harm others, you are, in fact, harming yourself. Mm -hmm. When you, you're thinking globally, you're thinking too small. That reminds me of, of the notion that our, our very molecules are formed uh, from the explosion of distant supernovas. Right. I mean, it's... It, and again, the one mind, as Larry Dossi put it, you know, yeah. that permeates everything. Mm -hmm.
Well, I like that idea of, of one consciousness. I think it's uh, an extremely important idea. As, as you pointed out earlier, Max Planck, the founder of quantum physics, uh, expressed it very clearly. He, he, he suggested there you can't get beneath consciousness. It is, right. it is consciousness from consciousness rises material. Yeah, the whole material universe exists within consciousness. It's easy to say those words, but mm -hmm. they're so profound. I think it may take uh, really the most brilliant thinkers on the planet uh, many, many decades, if not generations, to to really absorb the impact of what that means. But I think the important issue there is, I think that's exactly what is needed, yeah. but getting them oriented away from this where educational systems become involved, yeah. that are steeped in materialistic yeah. uh, belief systems. We reward people in physical sciences to work in narrow issues that push the envelope. You know, I was thinking on the Max Planck level, that, that takes a whole other level of thinking, and we don't generally reward those. Yeah. And one of the things I've said, uh, I have an agenda, and that's to try and assist and make it a principle for the best and brightest to be involved in these things. Mm -hmm. And as we know from many of our friends, these can be strong negatives uh, in the academic or scientific world. Because it's considered foolishness, and people right. uh, will use the horse laugh. Oh, you believe in those woo-woo uh, things. Well, as I said, the illusion <laughs> is very persistent. It is very persistent, and, and there are all sorts of economic incentives to right. keep it going the way it is going. But those very same economic incentives are the one that it, are leading the human race to the brink of disaster. Right. No, I don't think there's any, any doubt about that. Economics drives probably too much. And But again, you're back to your belief system. Mm -hmm. Many of the people I've dealt with uh, around the world, so many shamans, I, I use the term, look up to dirt, and when we're talking about a poverty level. Mm -hmm. And yet their understanding of the environment that they're in there, and happiness, by the way, we, we haven't yeah. talked about happiness quotients and, and those sort of things. Yeah. Um, they're better off than many of the rich folks that we know. Well, yes, there's something, uh, <laughs> as my sister loves to say, is money money can't buy you happiness, but it sure will let you choose your own form of misery. <laughs> oh, yes. And, it, and it, uh, it does seem to be the case that uh, many people, I, and I know personally people who are uh, extraordinarily wealthy who are miserable. Oh yes, well, we, we have joint friends who are like that, who yeah. are uh, very unhappy people. Uh, Victoria likes to talk about if there are a certain subset and they have certain privileges and you know access to medicine and capability. Now certainly they do get some treatments that are different. Uh, my classic example there is uh, John F. Kennedy mm -hmm. as president has his son died and has access to all of the capabilities uh, available. So and this also is in the conspiracy realm of assuming that there's a dark something that's out there that is going to impact. Mm -hmm. Well, this is where the whole question of survival after death becomes crucial because uh, no matter how wealthy you are, you're going to die just like every right. other human. Well. Most of them are. Anyway. We have had a couple of cases where they say that has happened. No, I think it's uh, sort of uh, inevitable. Um, and that's why I mentioned my, my guess is, and I've said this uh, several times, when you look at purely money, probably in the world there's about um, $10 million per year going into research in all of these phenomena, mm -hmm. UFO, near-death studies, et cetera, et cetera. And again, you compare that to the materialistic point, uh, illness, cancer, you just, it just pales. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, again, as you mentioned, ought to be of interest to 100% of the population. Why do we do it? Yeah. Now, we do run into issues of co overt control mechanisms, mm -hmm. meaning religion and things like that. Yeah. So one of the things I've talked about is, as you know, we've worked with ayahuasca and near-death experiences, I was surprised, uh, frankly, as we got into that, how many uh, religions, uh, not all, I mean, there's some 
you know, practitioners who are very supportive, but do not want you to deal with any of these phenomena. They consider it's their domain. That's right. And what they are going to do is, you know, there are certain dogma that is set out, and mm -hmm. if there's any changes, they're going to be the ones to, you know, present the information. The idea of having direct inter experience yourself um, mm -hmm. runs against a very strong power structure. Well, and, and our mutual colleague, Stefan Schwartz, who's been a guest on, on my program many times, believes it all goes back to the Council of Trent, which I it was many hundreds of years ago when the church uh, engaged in various rulings that the material world belongs to science, but everything else, the realm of consciousness, is the domain of the church. But again, that's uh, kind of a Caucasian Western viewpoint in and of itself, it because is. you do see the same considerations in other cultures. Yeah. They yeah. were the priests are the ones who are going to impart wisdom and. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, it, it, it gets infinitely complex. It is. Uh, John Alexander, once again, this has been a delightful conversation. I'm really pleased that you uh, come here to Albuquerque to be with me. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.